Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to Information Theory, that's EE 514A, um, it's fall quarter 2013. Um, my name is Professor Jeff Bilnes, and you can just call me Jeff if you want. Um, I think we're going to have a, uh, a very nice time this quarter, I hope, because this is a really fun class, it's an interesting class, it's actually one of my favorite classes to teach. And I hope that at the same, at, at, on the one hand you'll actually learn a lot, uh, this quarter, but at the same time I think you'll have a lot of fun and we'll dip into both uh, the technical aspects of information theory and even some of the philosophical aspects of information theory, uh, which some of you may find uh, entertaining or amusing. Um, this is actually a two-quarter course. Um, this is the first of two quarters. This is EE 514. Next quarter there'll be EE 515. Um, EE 514 is a core requirement course for many of you in EE, um, although I, I do suggest EE 515 is not, but I, I suggest that everybody take both because it really isn't right to do only 10 weeks of information theory to really get a sense of what information theory is, especially when you get into modern network information theory um, procedures, you really need to, to spend more than 10 weeks on it, especially if you've never really been exposed to these topics before. Um, so the first quarter, um, some of you might be familiar with some of these things, but what we will be doing is essentially concentrating on some of the sort of fundamental properties of, of information theory, which are things like you know, information measures, and the most important information measure that people use is that of entropy and the corresponding uh, quantities that are associated with entropy, like mutual information and callback likely divergence. Um, we'll also be looking at things like the as asymptotic equipartition property and the typical set theory sorts of things. Um, uh, data compression, essentially what is data compression and why is there sort of a fundamental limit? Why can't we compress, compress beyond a certain limit? If you've ever wondered that before. Why, why does anyone, everyone uses gzip, so why isn't, the, isn't it the case that when you keep running gzip over and over again on a file, it keeps getting smaller and smaller until it turns into one bit? Why is that? We will understand that mathematically and also to some extent philosophically. And that leads to the source coding theorem, which is a fundamental theorem that we will study and, and prove and some simple data compression algorithms like Huffman, but we'll, you know, many of you may, may have seen the Huffman coding procedure before, but we'll study it from the perspective of entropy and why Huffman, we'll see, is optimal. And also some other uh, methods like lempel ziv which is sort of the stream code and convolutional codes. Uh, and then we'll get into sort of more communications theory, so some of you have, have a communications background or are interested in communicating, and information theory also corresponds to essentially measuring how much information you can communicate over a channel. And it's the same underlying fundamental quantity of information is used to sort of measure things like the bottleneck, the bottleneck of a channel, how much, how many bits can you squeeze through a channel in a time, even if it's the case that the, the channel is noisy, meaning even if with some non-zero probability you're going to get a distortion of some sort and how, and what's critical about this theorem is how you can actually get um, perfect communication, essentially perfect communication even with a noisy channel. And we do, this is something we do all the time, and we will learn precisely why that is, and what, what perfect actually means in this case. And that corresponds to the channel coding theorem. Um, and then we'll look at this in a number of different ways, including the method of types, and we'll study differential entropy and Gaussian entropy. So these are for, for continuous sources, real value sources, as opposed to discrete alphabet sources. And, and we'll talk also about maximum entropy principle. So that'll basically be, that'll lead us into December. Um, then the second quarter, I'm not going to spend as much time um, going on this. This is starting in, oops, this is not spring. This is, uh, so now you can see why I have this iPad. This is um, winter 2013. So the second quarter, what we will do is um, get into uh, error correction coding and every different forms of coding. Uh, a sort of turbo coding, LDPC, low density parity check codes, and other forms of codes. Uh, modern codes are modern from the perspective of what actually was is used today on cell phones and other coding mechanisms. Um, and some other interesting aspects of other measures of complexity measurements or information measurements like Morgorov complexity or sometimes what's called algorithmic complexity. Um, spectral estimation. Uh, another issue is rate distortion theory, which is essentially both compression and communication. If you if you bound a form of distortion, you can actually communicate faster, but then there's sort of this underlying trade-off between distortion and communication, and rate distortion theory formalizes that trade-off. 
Um, and then the notion of alternating minimization, which is actually used for optimization and for computing things like the rate distortion function. And it's also used for computing the channel capacity uh, limit, in the, which we will learn about this quarter, but we won't learn precisely how to compute it until next quarter. Um, other notions of channel, like the Gaussian channel, which are continuous uh, noise sources, and this is something that you've probably seen before, for example. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen things like, for example, you get at each additional bit you get for channel use, you get an additional 6 dB of, of uh, signal noise ratio. That's something that we will, we will learn, and we will see precisely what it is. You might have, if, if anyone is interested in music, you might have heard that, for example, the standard compact disc has 96 dB of signal to noise ratio, and the reason why we're, the 96 comes from 16 times approximately 6. Um, uh, and we'll also uh, get into some much more modern topics like network information theory, which is still, even today, a fairly hot topic in information theory. <coughs> and some, <coughs> uh, some topics in information geometry, and also some uh, uses of polymatroids in information theory. And we'll, la we'll end with polymatroids because actually next spring I'm actually going to be teaching a course on polymatroids and some modular functions. So this will sort of lead very, very nicely into the spring quarter, but I'm not really going to talk about that. So if anyone's interested in that, this is actually a good first <laughs> two quarters to take. And if you want to spend a year with me, then you, are, you have the opportunity to do so. This is actually a very good sequence of courses to spend a year with me. On the other hand, maybe after today's lecture you'll be so sick of hearing me already that you'll say, oh God, I don't want to spend a year with that guy and you'll never see me again, which is also a possibility. Um, but in any event, that's, that's essentially the plan for the year. Um, it's actually somewhat unusual to have sort of a, you know, at the beginning of a quarter of three, we have three quarters of a year in a year, it's unusual to have sort of a, such a sort of coherent set of three classes together taught by uh, the same person. Usually the classes that are taught by any one given person throughout the year are much less coherent. So this is a rare opportunity to have a coherent set of courses taught by one person. Um, we're also going to talk a lot about applications, and we're going to intersperse these applications throughout these things on top. So um, we're, you know, I, I personally work a lot in machine learning. I'm not, I'm not an inf information theorist, although I use information and I study information, and a lot of the stuff that we use could actually be used by communications theory people. I know a lot about communication theory, but not... My, my concentration is really in machine learning, which is really pattern recognition and statistics and stochastic processes and um, probability theory. And also, it turns out that we'll also look at applications like natural image processing, which actually was one that was studied by the people who initially invented information theory. We'll look a little bit at some of those applications. And also other notions of complexity in biological science, even things like evolution we will study and use as applications as possible ways that you can sort of explain the utility of information. So we'll, we'll dance around a lot at, on different, um, different topics, which I think you will find at least uh, somewhat colorful and hopefully elucidating. Um, we have a web page. I don't know, has anyone, has anyone actually seen our web page yet? Um, that's our web page. Um, we have an assignment page as well, an assignment Dropbox. So we're using the system called, um, raise your hand if you're new to the UW. Okay, raise your hand if you're old. Okay, I always do that to make sure that the union of two things that partition the set are is the full set, and find out who didn't raise their hand. Are so, they a person? They should they should be yeah. So like the union of the two disjoint sets should be everything. But some people didn't like you didn't raise your hand, so you're neither new nor old, and you're in fact our TA. So our T is not TA is neither new nor old. But in any event, uh, let's let's get back to this topic. So this is. This is this um, has, this is can for those people who are old. This is a, a new system for me. This is the Canvas system. I've in the past used the Catalyst tool system. So this is the first time I've used this for the assignments and for the, for these other sorts of things. There's actually a nice set of tools there. I was looking at it the past couple of days. So there's a place where you turn in your homework assignment. There's a place for discussion boards. There's a place where um, you can sort of have open discussion with sort of shared whiteboards and, and sort of things like that. Like you could, for example, if I, held, if I hold an office hour and you want to come to the office hour but you don't want to be bothered to come in because it's snowing or raining or something, we can actually have an office hour view, via this system and we can do screen sharing and we'll have a shared whiteboard. So I, I, I think that the tools seem pretty neat, although they're, on the other hand, implemented in Java and it's, they may be a little bit slow. But 
I think that we should try it this quarter. So like during office hours, if you don't want to come in, you say, can I please use Canvas for the office hour and meet me? I will open up a discussion and anybody in the class can actually join that discussion just as if we were in the office and you were there, but you don't actually physically need to come to my office. Meaning I could be at home or I could be in a hotel somewhere in Bangladesh or I could be anywhere really. So basically we'll try it out and hope, hopefully it works. Like I said, I've never used it before. Um, we also have a discussion board. So this is, a, this is really meant for, for you to ask me questions. So don't email me questions if you have any. Post them on the discussion board. Why? Because if you have a question, chances are other people have a question. Okay? And if I answer a question to you by email, I would like everybody else to actually get the answer. I think that some people are very embarrassed about asking questions because they feel like if they ask questions, then maybe they're showing a weakness or something. But there have been many, many studies that have shown that the smartest people in the world are the ones who ask the most questions. So demonstrate to me how smart you are by asking lots of questions. And if you really, really feel bad, I mean, I, obviously, I, if you have a hang up about asking questions or something and you don't want to publish your question to the world, you can, I believe this next link, you can send me anonymous email and, or, or you could just send me email and say, please uh, answer this question, but remove my name from the question. And what I will do is I will post the question anonymously to the discussion board and answer it there, rather than doing it through email personally. Because I just think that's way, that way everybody benefits from both the question and from the answer. And also, you know, check in on the discussion board to see, um, you know, what other questions. If you feel like answering each other's questions, start, start a discussion, either about philosophy or, or the mechanics, the mathematical mechanics of what we're doing. That's also fine. I really think that we can, I mean, we're not a Coursera thing. We don't have 400,000 people in this course, so we can't do it as, as well as the Coursera courses can, but we can do it to some extent by sort of all contributing and helping each other uh, to better understand the material. Because that's, you know, you're in graduate school now, the, the grade isn't really what matters. What matters most is that you gain a good understanding of the material. That's my goal, is that, is that my goal is to impart in each of your minds a, a complete understanding of all of the material that which I'm sure when we just look at this list from a couple of slides ago very few of you actually know what I'm talking about but at the end of the quarter we will go back and look at this and you'll say oh I know what that is and I know what that is too and you'll say that's really cool stuff anyway discussion topics the other thing about this um, it used to be the case in the old catalyst tools that you could actually get an email every time there was a discussion thing posted I haven't figured out how to do that yet with this new system, so if anyone wants to go online and figure out how you can actually get an email alert when anybody posts anything, please let me know, because I, I usually like to do that. And in the past, when I've forgotten to do that with the old system, sometimes I wouldn't get an email and I would go a couple of days before I'd answer a discussion point. So if for some reason, like we can't figure this out, and if this is a sort of weakness of the Canvas system, uh, post your, I mean, this is maybe more work than necessary, but post your question there and then pop, you know, shoot me a quick email and say, hey, I posted a question on the discussion board, can you please answer it? Because I will try to, you know, look at it every day, but I'm, I'm far from perfect, as you will see, and I make mistakes and I forget things, and so therefore, if I forget to check the discussion topic for a couple of days, please remind me. Okay, um, okay any questions? Um, this, this is all logistics, by the way. If you if you were wondering, if you're wondering what the word logistics means, this is it. Okay, we are doing logistics, and some more logistics um, include things like, for example, the prerequisites. Like, what need you know to take this class? Uh, well, you should have some basic probability and stochastic processes, statistics background. You don't need to be an advanced statistician, but you should have some. You should know what probability is, and you should have taken some probability classes. In your undergraduate, and maybe some convex analysis would be useful. You know, not the most advanced stuff, but you should certainly know what convex function is, and those sorts of things. Um, it's usually nice to take some of these uh, EE courses, like EE 505 or 508, or any of the STAT 500 classes are good. Uh, we will be using MATLAB, so you know, I, I think everybody knows MATLAB these days, um, or R. People use R in the statistics world and. MATLAB in the computer science e and electrical engineering world. Um, the course is open to anybody in any department, um, although it's an EE course. Because, like I said, 
people don't realize it, but information theory is critical. I mean, I think, I think personally an understanding of information theory is critical to understanding things like biology or understanding machine learning or understanding statistics or understanding combinatorics. I mean, you, you really need to know information theory to, to get a complete understanding of a lot of these other topics, economics as well. We're in a sort of economics building, a business building. They should be here. They should be taking this class too. They don't know it, but they should be. Um, okay, homeworks. Um, there's going to be about six or seven homeworks every quarter, or, or for late quarter, actually next quarter as well. Uh, they'll be due in about one or two weeks. There's actually a homework that's out now, homework zero, which is due next Tuesday. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, but normally you'll get about one to one and a half weeks to turn it in. Um, they might involve MATLAB exercises. Uh, so you need to have access to MATLAB. Um, I'm just going to assume that everybody has access to MATLAB. Um, shoot me an email if you don't for some reason. Um, so I guess these are not designed to be problem sets that you do the night before. So don't wait for, for the night before to do them. Some of them might take several days. Some of them might take just several days to think about. And the whole idea is you see a problem and you think about it for a while. You know, you don't learn if you just sit down the night before and rush through a problem set. Some of the problems will require some thinking. So please don't wait to the last minute. It won't be as much fun. You know? I mean, if you're, if you're a perennial procrastinator and you wait until the very end, last minute, you won't learn as well as if you spend time thinking about the problem. Some of these problems are really fun and cool. So I do encourage everybody to, for your own sakes, spend time on the problem. Um, and, and you can talk about them with each other. Um, please, please don't look online for a solution. Um, some of the problems will be new, some of the problems won't be. Um, you know, um, I think that uh, we will have an interim, an in-class midterm. Um, uh, right, so the, the midterm is actually going to be on a little bit on the early side, so it's October 31st, uh, 2013, in class. Um, and, and a final exam, uh, so our current slide is Tuesday, December 10th. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure when we're going to do it yet. The thing is, it's, I'm actually traveling on that day. So one possibility is to um, have it when I'm not here, which, um, which is not good because then if there's any questions, so that means our TA would have to administer it. So what I could possibly do, and I'm, I'm thinking about doing this, is sort of being here by Skype. And I've never done that before, sort of attended a midterm by Skype. So if there's any questions, I can sort of answer it, answer the questions, sort of with your laptop sitting here. I'll be watching everybody <laughs> from wherever, wherever I am. Um, so that might be an option. Maybe that's a good option. Um, but um, I guess uh, if that doesn't work, we'll have to find another time. I don't know. But anyway, that's so like I said, I don't know exactly when the final is. The, the, the midterm is set, though, Thursday, October 31st. Um, grades will be based on a combination of the final and the midterm and on the homework. Um, and like I said, um, you know, again, all of the lectures are being, are going to be recorded. This current lecture is being recorded now, I hope. Um, yes, it is being recorded. Um, and what I do is I post them, I post the lectures on YouTube, on a YouTube channel. So that means that you can be sitting at home in your living room entertainment center on a Saturday night with a glass of wine watching this lecture, right? Enjoying, rather than watching the latest episode of Breaking Bad, you can be watching this, which is much more entertaining, I'm sure. Um, or you can be on your cell phone in a bus watching this lecture. Um, or you can imagine many other places where you might be watching this lecture, which I won't mention. But in any event, it's, it's for several reasons that I'm doing this. One, because it's sort of become common to do this. Another is that uh, a few people have a little bit of a conflict with another class, which has partial overlap. And another reason is that there will be a few lectures where um, I need to travel. So there will still be a lecture, but I'm just going to be doing it by YouTube. So I will be giving a lecture, and I will send out an email or put it on a discussion board or something. And, and you won't need to come to class. You just watch it on YouTube. Um, I do get to know how many people watch the lecture, although if one person watches it like 20 times, then I might think everybody's watched it and be happy, but I guess uh, I do, you know, it, it is important to watch and to see every lecture. The nice thing about actually these lectures is that if there's something I said that's confusing, or actually some people actually prefer the YouTube lectures to the real ones because they can pause at the end, you know, if I 
if I say something and they want to pause and think about it before going on, that's actually something that people find very useful. And, and again, the reason why I use YouTube is because it's just so accessible. Everybody, you know, YouTube is available everywhere. You know, you know, Blu-ray players have YouTube, and iPhones have, and smartphones have YouTube. This is our book. It's uh, Elements of Information Theory. It's a classic book. It actually was originally released in 91. This is the second edition, which was released a few years ago. Uh, and it's pretty complete and up-to-date. I mean, there's been some recent stuff, but most of the recent stuff is uh, in is not going to be in material that we cover this quarter. It's going to be in, in, in like in the network information theory literature that we cover next quarter. So this is pretty up to date. Uh, you can get it at the bookstore or say at Amazon or wherever you want. Um, uh, this, just make sure you get the second edition, not the first edition. There's still a bunch of first editions out there. And you have a reading assignment, which is to read chapters one and two of this book. So that's an assignment. I'm not going to check that you do the reading, but everyone should start reading this book. Um, but I'm going to actually mention a number of other uh, very good and relevant texts. Um, these are all books that I have in the past drawn from. And I'm, I'm not directly following the book in my lectures. I'm following many different books, but I'm still going to give you a reason. You know, it's sort of insane to say, OK, go out and buy 20 books, and I'm going to read this page from this book and that page from that book. I'm going to give you a reading assignments as close as possible to the lecture, but there are a number of other books that I'm drawing from that you should, you should look at. So the first is by Raymond Young. This is actually another very good book. In fact, I've used this book before. Before, actually, the second edition of the Tom Cover and Thomas book came out, I used this book a few times. And this is a great book for a number of reasons. They actually have a nice chapter on network information theory. But it, since that time, actually, there's been another book. Um, this is the first edition of the book. It's still, you know, some of it is still quite up to date. Um, this is a classic old book, 1968, Information Theory and Reliable Communication. So this was the go-to book for information theory for many years. But it's still very, very good. And it's, in some sense, pure. If you, if you sort of want a sort of a more pure mathematical description of things, not so much for computer scientists, but more for sort of math or engineering people, this is a great book to use. Kolbach's book from 1968 is also still a classic. Um, this is a book that has a lot of sort of measures theoretically accurate and LeBeg style descriptions of some of the properties that we're going to be talking about. So if you really are into real analysis and complex analysis, actually really real analysis, more so than complex analysis, then this is the book for you. But there's still some great, great things in here that are not available anywhere else. This is probably the most difficult of the books. So Amir Scissor is sort of a, is a famous information theorist, and he wrote this book, which has some, some really, really important theorems in there. But this is not a book I'd recommend reading unless you're sort of uh, a masochist, because this is extraordinarily complicated and difficult to read. But I would be remiss to not include this book in, in the list, because it's a classic. It's the book that everybody says you shouldn't read, and so everybody cites it a lot, saying you shouldn't read this book. So it's well cited. Um, and this is a, another great book. This is a uh, from David Mackay, Information Theory, Learning, and Infants or Infants and Learning Algorithms. This is a sort of information theory book, but comes from a strongly maybe both machine learning and Bayesian perspective. Some of the things we're talking about are actually drawn from this book because he has a nice take and, on, on information theory. So we'll be drawing from this. Actually, this book is also available online for free, so you can download it. I mean, he even put, he puts it on his webpage. Just you know, go to David Mackay's webpage and you can actually download it. But on the other hand, I would recommend you buying it. Why does he make his books available for free? Because he's a nice guy, I guess. So actually, I know him. He's a nice guy. Another classic book is by Robert McLeese from Caltech. This is another book we might draw from. Um, these are some older books that have some sort of nice intuitive explanations of, of some of the intro stuff. And I've drawn from some of these to sort of help us all get an, a better intuition as to what in, information and entropy is, at least as measured by entropy. Uh, this is another one. These are old books, but they're still good. Um, yet another one. These, are these, these books are available. These are these Dover reissues. And so what Dover does is it takes these old math books that have gone out of print and reissues them in paperback and charges like $5 for them. So they're, it's really, really nice what Dover does. Uh, so this is it's worth having. Um, and uh, I misspelled this name. I spelled the name wrong here. So this is Kinchin. I think that's how you pronounce it. Kinchin. Uh, this is actually a great 
classic small book that sort of, in some, in, in a very small number of pages, I think it's like 40 or 50 pages, summarizes all of the classic results, you know, much, much of which we're going to be covering this, this quarter. Um, even though it's written a while ago, as you'll see, you know, a lot of, a lot of what um, we're going to be talking about came from that one single paper in the 1940s, which created basically a, an explosion, a scientific explosion of, of results. This was some of you, maybe some of you have heard of Claude Shannon. Raise your hand if you've heard of Claude Shannon. So he's like, he's, he's like the Einstein of information theory, and I think he's actually like the Einstein. He should be as well known as Einstein because of what he did was so influential. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about him. Uh, another book uh, uh, is, is the convex classic, you know, sort of intro convex optimization book by Boyd and Vandenberger. That's another great book for convex stuff. If you're interested in probability, there's the building is lead book, which is classic. Uh, another good probability book is this Williams book. Another, this is more of a measure theoretically accurate probability book. Dirac's work is nice. Th this is actually a really nice book. We don't unfortunately use this book for probability random processes, but I love this book for two reasons. One, because it's complete and they have a really, really nice description of lots of different things, the and Sturzacher, but the other thing is it's written by British people, and everybody knows that British people write better than Americans do, right? British people write much better English than Americans write English, and so they, they are British, and so they, it's just written really, really nicely, so you feel like you're reading Shakespeare when you're reading this book. I'm actually not, I'm joking, but it actually is very well written. It's very clear and just, it's well written. Um, okay, so um, they study this book in literature classes. They don't understand what it means, but they study the English. So, <coughs> okay, slides. So you, you notice that I'm using slides, right? Has anyone noticed that I'm using slides? I'm not using a whiteboard. And I have uh, the ability to write on these slides. So these are slides. Um, this is actually the second time I've used these slides. So we should be, I should, I, I think that I will be able to get the slides ready for each class the night before the class. Maybe I'll get ahead a couple of lectures, but um, at, there should be some version of the slides right before the class. One of, one of the things you can do, I mean, if you have iPads or laptops or whatever, feel free to bring in them and you can just download your slides onto your laptop and, and you can take notes on them directly using whatever note-taking app that you can mark up PDF files you want. Um, the other thing I mean, I want to let you do is that these slides, so the slides are going to be available in, in three formats. So there's going to be sort of the, the presentation format that I give you. There's going to be a sort of two slide per page format. That's going to be smaller and maybe it's useful if you want to, like, can you hold that up actually? If you want to print them out. So that's the two slide for, uh, per page and also my notes that I'm doing now, like these squiggly lines, are also going to be placed on the web page. But of course, I can't do that until after the lecture. And so if you go down to the bottom of the web, web page, they'll be there. So if there's something I wrote or if there's a drawing that you like, um, you don't actually have to copy it down. You can just get it from, from the web page after, uh, after I upload it. So you have three different ways of getting the material, one of which, two of which are built before lecture and one of which is after the material. So I hope that that's enough. Now, I've spent an enormous amount of time preparing these slides. And I, I think that these are meant to help, in, so, in some sense, be self-contained. Uh, so some the things that we do in class will be complementary to the things you read in the book. Uh, the things like the midterm and the final will be drawn both from the slides and from the book. So at the very least, you should be studying two sources, the book and the slides. You got questions about the book? You got questions about the slides? What do you do? What happens? You post it to the discussion board, right? So the discussion board is where we post things. Um, the slides probably won't have too many typos and bugs in them because, like I said, these are the second time I've used them. And last time I used these slides, I was careful when I discovered a typo or bug, or more likely when one of you guys, or your, your, your former brethren from last time I taught this course, um, you guys let me know about these typos. I, I was pretty meticulous about correcting them, but it's still quite possible and almost certain, in fact, that I, that I missed some or that there are new typos that I'm introducing as I'm updating the slides this year. So keep an eye on them. If you see a, slide, a typo or what you think is a typo here, ask me. I will not only mark it on the slides, but I will go in and update the, the unannotated PDF files with the typos. So I'm, I'm pretty careful about that. So you have a typo-free experience. 
Um, this is our code map, um, roadmap. So we're, today we're um, in lecture one. So it's just an overview and entropy. So any, uh, any questions? This is still logistics, believe it or not. Oops. No questions? Everything clear? Okay, so this is the review section, and since we don't know anything, we have nothing to review. So let's move on. Uh, you do have a, a reading, which is oh, this is the wrong book. <laughs> don't don't you don't use this book. <laughs> use uh, in, in cover into this. There's a typo, right? Cover in Thomas. Right. So there's a uh, there's a typo and a fix to the typo. Okay. Oh, this is not a typo. So we so homework zero. So um, I wanted to talk about homework. Um, so homework is is due. They will be due at odd times. Like for example, this one is due at 11:45 p.m. at night on next Tuesday, after class. Uh, so how are you going to turn in something to me at 11:45 p.m.? Well, it's going to be electronic. So if if we have so if you go to that that Canvas webpage, one of the links that are that I gave you a little bit earlier gives you a a link to our Dropbox, and our Dropbox actually is where you turn in all of the homework. Um, you can so I'm asking for PDF files, and you can it, you can do it in in say LaTeX or God forbid Microsoft Word, um, or if you really don't like either of them, it's perfectly fine if you want to do them on paper. But I'm not accepting paper. You have to take photos or scan that in and turn it into a PDF file and upload that. Um, the grading is going to be done entirely electronically as well, so the grading will be done there. There's a sort of in, in each, at least I hope it is. If, 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 it, if it doesn't have this, we're going to have to move back to Catalyst. But basically, when you turn in each homework, you can go in and there's like a little private discussion area about each homework. And, um, and that's where the grades will be. So the grades will probably be in text. You know, it's like problem one, you didn't do this right. Problem two, you didn't do this right. Problem three, great job. Problem four, great job. Problem five, you didn't do this right. Or hopefully you'll get more right than that. But the grading will be electronic. So that means that as soon as they are graded, you will see your the corrections in your grade. There's no paper passing back and forth. And the grades will happen online. So some people will have maybe had their homework graded sooner than others because maybe it takes a day or something. And the person doing the grading is, can you please stand up, our TA, um, John Soup Park. Is, is that pronounced right? Yeah, John Soup. Yeah, so John Soup and I go way back. Uh, I remember back like um, last Friday when we first met, we, yes. uh, we, we had a great time uh, talking about uh, nothing other than information theory. So no, actually, we, I, we don't go way back. I just, we just met, but um, John Soup is going to be doing the grading. It, the, the strategy is if you have any questions about the grades, you should um, ask him, not me. Uh, but if you disagree with him, then you should ask me. It's only if you disagree with him, then you ask me, and I will resolve any and all disputes. Um, uh, <coughs> the first homework, by the way, again, is, is due on Tuesday, and it's a credit, no credit. And it's actually not credit. It's just sort of some background convex stuff. So the next, the real first real homework is going to come out on Tuesday. Next Tuesday, and it's going to be due a week from Tuesday. So we're going to have a bunch of homeworks. I think the first month, we're going to be pretty intensive in terms of homework. The reason why is because our midterm is a little bit early. Okay, so we're going to be doing a lot of homework this next month. So, so be ready. But this is actually good, because you'll really dive in. And you won't, um, there, there won't be a delay. And also see if you like the topic pretty early, which I think, you know, I can't imagine you not liking this topic. Um, raise your hand if you know what information theory is already. A little bit. Okay. So raise your. So you must have a reason that you're here. You, did you did you just hear that information theory is, is interesting and you want to learn about it? Or I guess I should have done a survey. Maybe I'll do a survey like why are you taking information theory? I mean, one possible reason is that it's a requirement in the EE department, and you're just taking it in order to fulfill a requirement. Um, this is a wonderful way to fulfill a requirement because of the coolness of this material. So I think uh, you've made a wise choice in taking this class, I think. And hopefully in the next week or so, you will, you'll see. OK, any questions about logistics before we actually begin? So what is information theory? Um, I mean, essentially, what information theory is, is meant for is to study how entities communicate with each other and to try to sort of quantify 
how and why and what is communicated, what communication means. Now, we all sort of have this notion of communicate. Like, for example, I'm talking to you now, and I'm communicating to you now. But um, what exactly am I communicating? What is up in my in what I'm saying that which contains the information? And maybe the information, you know, the question is, well, what is even information? Like, what is information? Because in order to study things like compression, you know, how, you know, let's say we're on a computing system and we want to somehow compress down to a sum nut to some number of bits, you know, what if there's a lot of information, maybe we can't compress very much. But if there's a little bit of information, if there's a lot of redundancy, then maybe we can compress a lot. So if I say the same thing over again, if I say the same thing over again, if I say the same thing over again, then I am being redundant and I didn't need to say that three times. And maybe if you were to remember me saying something, you don't remember that I'm saying it three times, you only remember that I'm saying it once, and so that in some sense is a form of compression. And so therefore I'm being redundant. Uh, the information somehow is being expressed in an inefficient manner. In inefficient meaning that I could have expressed the same information by saying fewer words. But the question is we really want to sort of quantify that both mathematically but also philosophically because there's a lot of philosophical sort of issues associated with information theory and communication theory. Now we have a, uh, you know, in information theory we have a sort of a very utilitarian, very mathematical, precise definition of information. And we will look at the strengths and the weaknesses of this definition from a philosophical perspective before we end up going on proving theorems about it. And that's sort of in some sense the goal of today. Um, there's other, another aspect of information theory which is coding theory, which is like how do you take a signal of some sort um, and sort of transmit it from one point to another point in a way that even if the transmission line or the, the, capa the, ch the, ca the channel that that information is being transmitted on is almost certainly going to give you an error. Like right now, when you listen to an internet radio station or any digital you know, download of, of anything, that it's really an analog line, right? It's analog and there's noise, there's noise and there's all sorts of crackling and buzzing and crazy stuff that's happening. But somehow you are still able to get a perfect copy of that song or that movie or that message, whatever it is that you're sending. And when you copy a file from one side of the world to the other side, you know, you're in all likelihood going to get exactly the same bit pattern. But the underlying fundamental medium through which that file has been translated is noisy, is analog. And so error corrected coding is essentially a way of essentially, in a, an intelligent way, minimally adding redundancy in such a way that you can actually do these sorts of things. So, um, so we're also going to talk that there's you know communications theory, but we're also going to look at information theory, how it applies to lots of fields. So what are some of the fields that it applies to? Well, you know, there's communications theory, there's also cryptography, because if you want to encrypt something, maybe you want to change the code in such a way that you can guarantee that there's no information about the original signal without actually knowing the key. Like, what if it's possible to prove that you have a file you want to encrypt and a password and the encrypted source? If you can prove that the encrypted source has no information, that there's, there's no inf way of essentially going between the source and the encrypted source, the plain text and the crypt text, without actually having the password. So information theory is useful there. Um, there's also computer science, you know, not just data compression, but also representation of information in bits, things like gzip and, uh, and network uh, communications and latencies and bandwidths associated with communications. Um, there's also a lot of computer science, theoret you know, theoretical computer science components that are associated with information theory, and sort of algorithmic aspects of Compression algorithms and efficiencies. Uh, information theory relates, and in, in some sense, it's inspired by statistical mechanics and physics, and statistical thermodynamics in particular. Um, mathematics and probability, um, philosophy of science. You know, what, it, you know, what is information? Linguistics and natural language processing. Um, speech recognition has become a very important um, area in technology, and speech recognition got its start in. Um, information theory. In fact, the whole the information theoretic model was that which inspired one of the main ways that people do speech recognition today. 
but that also applies to other um, aspects of machine learning and pattern recognition, also e economics, like biology and genetics. Like in some sense, you could say the parents are communicating their genes to the children, or the parents are communicating their genes to the grandchildren indirectly via the children. And so that human society, or any animal, or any, any organism, as generations go by, you can think of it as a communications channel. And it's noisy. It, there's genetic mutation. That's a form of noise. But somehow information is communicated, information in the form of a genome. And maybe we could study that. In fact, people do study that. Uh, also, um, neurobiology. I didn't mention that. But the neurobiology, like the way in which neurons in the brain communicate to each other. How, do, how efficient is the brain? I mean, the brain is essentially an organism that essentially is trying to do things. Is it doing things efficiently? Is one neuron communicating to another neuron in an efficient way? Is the signal that's being sent from one neuron to another neuron compressed before it gets sent so that you use less energy? Is there an advantage to doing that? You need to eat less food if you use less energy to communicate a signal to another signal in your body or in your brain. I mean, th these are all things for which information theory, and people, actually neurobiologists use, neuroscientists use information theory to study these properties. In fact, it's amazing that some people have actually found that if you run certain compression algorithms on certain signals, you actually get other sort of neural spike training codings of signals that are very similar to the kinds of signals you actually measure in the brain. So somehow the brain is at a very low level doing, uh, at a very simplistic level doing information theoretic uh, processing. Also psychology, anyway, the list goes on and on and on. So like I said earlier, information theory sort of exploded on the scene, I mean literally exploded, by uh, a paper that uh, someone by the name of Claude Shannon wrote in, in 1948. Actually, it was written before 1948. It was written in the, in the early 1940s. But it was considered so important that um, because of World War II, it wasn't released. It wasn't made public. And he wasn't allowed to publish it because it was, it was written at a time when People, national security was at premium, and people didn't want this information, this to get out. But once it was published in 1948, it created this. I mean, he he single-handedly created an entire field. I mean, the influence of this paper, the influence on society at large, and on computer science. Like I wouldn't be using an iPad right now if it wasn't for Claude Shannon. You know, we think that Steve Jobs was influential, but you know, without Claude Shannon, there would be no Steve Jobs. There would be no Microsoft. There'd be no Apple. There'd be nothing. There'd be no internet. I mean, none of these things would happen without his contributions, without Claude Shannon's contributions. So it's amazing. So Shannon, you know, it's, it's funny because you can say that Shannon was actually trying to solve certain problems in electrical communications, and he was very motivated by, you know, the problems, the technical problems that were being faced during World War II. So he, was, he had a lot of motivation for doing what he did. And it, it might be controversial to say this, but maybe he wouldn't have been as motivated had World War II not happened. Not have happened. I don't know. But um, he certainly, Shannon certainly changed the, the, the world. Um, so now a lot of the results that we're going to be talking about, like the source coding theorem and the channel coding theorem, we're going to sort of lead up to these. These are single theorems, but it takes a lot of understanding and intuition before you can actually prove the theorem. I mean, it's not just a mathematical proof, but we want to understand the intuition behind this, this theorem. So a lot of this stuff came out of this one paper. And actually, the paper, you can get it online. It's downloadable for free, Mathematical Theory of Communications. Type it into any search engine, and, and you'll see it's an amazing, it's an amazing work. Uh, and and it's, it's remarkably modern, even after so many years. Um, Oh, there's also like things like the IEEE transactions and information theory, which is published many times per year, and you know he his paper essentially started that. Imagine if you published one paper and created an entire field. Imagine having that impact. So um, the key fundamental sort of revolutionary idea, revolutionary idea, was that. is that communication involves sending information, whatever that is, which she defines, from one place to another place, over a medium that might have errors. And the other key idea was that even if it has errors, you can communicate perfectly, which at that time people thought was impossible. People thought, there's no way if a channel has errors, your signal is going to be received with errors. And 
before the 1940s, the, that idea, the whole idea that you can communicate perfectly over a noisy channel, was thought of, you know, as as crazy. But I mean, now we take that idea for granted. So there's Clyde Shannon. I just want to sort of make a little shrine to him because of his influence. His story, he was extraordinarily bright, obviously, and, and, and incredibly creative. He was a, uh, he got his PhD at MIT, of course, and then um, went to Bell Labs, where he published this paper, as a Bell Labs tech journal. And this is what it looked like originally. And um, he, it's a kind of interesting story because he, he um, died actually not that long ago. I can remember when I was studying information theory for the first time in, in, the, in the 90s. I didn't realize that Clutch Shannon was still alive. And he died, I remember, I was teaching information theory in 2001. I've been teaching this class for a while. I was teaching it in 2001 when the news that Clutch Shannon died came out, and I was shocked that I thought, well, I thought it was a long time ago. So it turns out that even for all his brilliance, he actually uh, had some sort of degenerative cognitive disease. And he ended up, um, by the end of the 1960s, being unable to, to really think and talk and communicate. And he, he was, I think, I think it might have been Alzheimer's, I can't remember exactly, but he had some form of severe mental decline. So the remaining, you know, 30 years of his life, he was basically taken care of by his wife and he couldn't, he couldn't really think or work anymore. So, but still, you know, his, his run from the 40s to the 60s, basically a 20 year run, he had enormous influence. Um, there is there are books, by the way. You can actually buy a book, which is just the collected works of Claude Shannon. It's like one book, which has every paper he's ever written. It's, it's about this thick. I, I actually have it. I don't have it here. OK, so the idea of communications is that you have some, some source signal, which is um, this, right? And the source is what you want to send. Like, it's maybe me speaking. Or maybe it's a song, or maybe it's a it's a message, or it's a it's a sensor that exists in space that you want to send down to some sort of recording device on Earth. It gets encoded, and encoded is a, is essentially a, is a transformation of the signal into a form that's amenable to be sent over a noisy channel. So you can model the channel as a as a sort of a mapping that goes from input to output that gets distorted by noise. Okay. So then, after it gets distorted by noise, we, we have the signal here, and it gets decoded. And after it's decoded, then the receiver sort of receives the message, which may or may not have some errors. And hopefully, what we want to do is design the system in such a way that there isn't any noise, uh, or sorry, in the, in the final uh, received signal. Uh, you can think of the decoder and the encoder as inverses of each other, in the sense that the encoder sort of takes um, signal in sort of its raw form, which could be a sound form, and turns it into something which might be completely different, might look totally different than sound, the sound waves. And then the encoder does the opposite. It takes it from that encoded signal and turns it into something that's recognizable again to us or to the receiver. So what are some examples? So voice, um, me speaking right now is a, is a source. Um, uh, these, are, these are examples of sources. like be speaking or just words like text in a, in a document or pictures like images on, on Facebook or Twitter or whatever these, these that's, I'm, I'm forgetting, you know, um, Instagram, all these latest, these, these things. I'm, I'm, that's, I'm really showing my age, not by calling these latest things. Um, music, art, um, which is I guess a form of pictures, um, space probes that have sensors that are sending information back to Earth. like. Voyager 1, which is now outside of our galaxy, as everybody knows, it's somehow sending information back to us. And it's a, it, human cells, like the cells, the, the DNA, the genetic information, the DNA is a sort of a source. Just before reproduction, it essentially goes through a, sen, a, a form of encoding. Human parents about to reproduce. Um, sensory input, like the olfactory organism, when you're smelling things, there's sort of a source signal, which are the molecules that exist and are encoded by the nose into uh, neuro, neurotransmitting signals sent over neurotransmitters. Um, and any signal, binary data could be a source. So what is the channel? 
Well, channel is a telephone line or a high frequency radio link. There are lots of different channels. Space communications link, storage. So you know, a channel need not be something that you send information over through space, but it could be something that's being sent over time. So like you could take a signal like a, a, and save it to disk and then read it back tomorrow or the next week or next year. Um, um, a biological organism, like a channel might be a, a series of a neural system in a, in a body. Like if, if, you, if you step on a pin, that's a signal which gets sent to your brain that you stepped on the pin and it takes a certain amount of time, but it's a channel. It needs to communicate information to you that you've stepped on the pin. And the receiver is sort of the destination of the information. Um, it can be a person or a computer or a disk or any of these things that are associated with um, um, the corresponding source and channel. The source and the source and the receiver need not be the same. Like it might be a music file going to disk. Right? Um, now, why is there noise? I mean, so noise could be caused by a number of different reasons. But the idea is that you know. There's a time varying frequency response, or there might be crosstalk, or there might be thermal noise, um, switching noise. So the idea is that the channel is often analog. You know, everything in the world is analog, and whenever there's analog, there's all sorts of other signals. You know, our imperfect model of the way the system works might essentially be treated as noise. There could be nonlinearities. There are lots of different reasons why noise might exist. And you can think of noise. Noise is sort of our acknowledgement that we don't have a perfect understanding of the universe. So maybe the universe is deterministic, but we don't we, we can't be bothered coming up with an accurate enough model to account for all of the different reasons why noise might occur, why the signal that we send is not exactly the signal we receive. So what do we treat it as? We treat it as random noise. Random meaning it obeys on average certain properties, like it's a Gaussian or it obeys some distribution. But other than that, we don't know why it exists. So we just treat it as noise and then deal with it as noise. It's, it's just randomness. Um, the encoder is processing that's done. You know, it basically takes the signal and makes it agreeable or amenable for sending over the channel. Um, now, there's two things that it, an encoder does. Um, I'm speaking to you, and there's a lot of redundancy in, in what I'm saying to you. Right? Not just the words. I mean, it might, first of all, it might be the case that maybe you, some of you have had more exposure to information theory than others. So my words, for some of you, are more redundant than they are for others. But um, also just in the sort of lower level aspects of my voice, like you know, there's, there's a certain, there's a pitch associated with my voice, and maybe that's redundant. You don't actually need all that information. You can just say, well, I just kind of represent the pitch. I don't actually need to store the entire waveform, the sound waveform. There's a lot of redundancy. So the idea of the encoder, the first stage of the encoder, is to sort of reduce the redundancy, to keep only what we really need. You know? So compression, which is a form of compression. So it reduces redundancy. And then the second stage of the encoder is to insert redundancy. So first we, we remove the redundancy that's associated with the signal, and then we add redundancy that's needed in order to communicate it over the channel without error. Now that might sound like a really weird thing to do, to remove redundancy and then add redundancy back. But the type of redundancy that you, that you remove and then add is very, very different. Because the re redundancy removal is that which is associated with the source. And the redundancy that you add is that which is useful to reduce errors by, in the channel. Now the source channel theorem, the joint source channel theorem by Shannon, was the first to show that you can do this, that you can just have a redundancy adder for any channel, and you can use that to transmit any kind of source. Um, and this was remarkable So what, at the time. So what you could take a channel and a channel encoder, and then you could first compress a source down to its, as you will learn soon, its entropy limit. And you will have, and then what happens is you get a very efficient representation of that signal, because all of the redundancy is gone. So every bit matters the same amount. In the compress. And then you can send it over the channel, over any channel. And it doesn't matter what you're sending, whether it's music or text or radar or any type of signal. It doesn't matter the underlying carrier frequency of the signal. You can have very high frequency data being sent over the channel, very low frequency data being sent to the channel, discrete data, continuous data. 
any of that different types of data, any different type of data can be sent over the same channel. Thanks to the source channel theorem. And that also was a people thought that it, that wasn't the case. People thought that you needed to have different types of channels or different types of data. So what is a code? We'll learn about code. So a code is essentially is, is a mechanism for expressing the information of one signal by another. So you sort of say, I'm going to encode this signal. So that might be, for example, in encoded, encoding a signal as a, in a, essentially a basis representation, or it might be essentially a vector, a sort of a set of bit vectors which we use to represent a signal. There are lots of different forms of codes. And, uh, and encoding is essentially a representation. So a code is essentially a strategy for representing a class of signals, and encoding is what happens to a given signal once it's represented by a code. So what the decoder does is the opposite. So it sort of it, it exploits the redundancy that has been added by the encoder for the sake of the channel to remove errors. And then it adds back in the redundancy so that the signal can be received by a receiver of the same type as the source. So like a cell phone is a perfect example of that. So when you speak on the cell phone, the encoder first compresses your speech and then encodes it for the cell phone channel. And then the other channel then sort of decodes the speech into its compressed form and then re-expands it to have all of the redundancy in speech that you would ordinarily have if the person was sitting right next to you speaking. And so, so that you recognize your, your, your parent as your parent, or you recognize, you, know, who, so you recognize your friend as your friend. Otherwise, uh, that wouldn't be the case. So the decoder sort of removes and fixes the transmission errors, and that's essentially how you do perfect communication. And it restores the signal by adding redundancy to the signal. So here's an example. Here's an example. This is actually from McKay's book, and I really like this example because this sort of really captures very, very neatly the heart of, of communication theory. So let's say we have some, we have some uh, signal, which in this particular case is a very simple uh, comic. Okay. Um, so th this, by the way, it's, this only looks at one function of the encoder. This doesn't do a compression first. But the first thing that this thing does is it adds redundancy that's useful for the channel. So the way it adds redundancy is a, it's a very naive way. What it does is it just repeats the Im image three times. Okay. So the image is a, is a picture repeated three times. So then rather than then there's a noisy channel, and the channel is, is this thing here, is, from, is this step right, from here to here. And what the channel does is it adds um, noise, which basically flips a bit randomly with probability 0.1. So, so with probability 0.9, you keep the same bit in probability 1, but when you don't. Okay. And you can see that maybe you know, about 10% of the bits, bits have been flipped okay, on each image. Now, if only one image had been sent, there'd be no way of knowing what the original image is. You'd just say, OK, well, I've, I've suffered some noise. But the assumption is that bits are flipped not only randomly, but uniformly at random and independently. So every bit is independently flipped of every, everything else, which is actually a reasonable assumption for many channels. And so what you do then is you, you add this redundancy before you send it. You send the image over the channel three times. You get back three images, noisy images. And what does the decoder do? Well, it says, it, let's just do a majority vote. So every bit, every corresponding bit, for every bit of the original image, you actually have three noisy bits. You just take a vote. You have an election. OK, well, these two guys say it should be a 0, and this guy says it should be a 1. Let's make it a 0. These guys, these guys, these two guys say it should be a 1, this guy says it's a 0. There's always going to be a majority because there's an odd number of them. And you get back something when you take the majority vote, which is significantly cleaner than before. Now, imagine if you, um, rather than added only three images, what if you did 10 images, or 20 images, or 50, or 100 images? By the time you get a hit 100 images, the chance of actually getting any error would be astronomically small. So effectively, you know, the universe will end before you get an error in your, in your signal, you know, because the probability is so small that you get an error that you'll essentially never see an error. And that's essentially the world we live in. When you get a file, over the internet, it's not impossible 
that you will get an error. Even with all the stuff that's happening to make sure that you don't get an error, it's not absolutely impossible. But the chances of getting an, in, an error are astronomically small. Um, unless you're using Windows, in which case, it's, oh, no, no, I'm just, I'm just uh, I can't say this kind of stuff on, I'm being recorded. So um, Windows is, is really a nice operating system. Um, now, one thing about this, this code that you might have noticed is that, in some sense, the efficiency has gone down, right? Because like each time we're, we're repeating the image, we're sending more bits over the channel, right? That's that's a lot. And if we were to repeat the image a hundred times, the rate of a code. What, is, what does the rate mean? It sort of means, like, for each bit of the orig original image, how many bits do we send in the channel? So the number of bits per channel used. So if we if we if we repeat this three times, we get one-third bit per channel use, right? So our rate is one-third. And if we repeat the image a hundred times, our rate becomes one one-hundred. So while our um, probability of error in the reconstructed image goes down astronomically small, our rate, the number of bits per channel use that we get using this code, also goes down to zero. And so as the limit, as the number of images we repeat, goes to infinity, the rate of the code goes down to zero. And so this was what the state of affairs was thought to be in the 1940s, the early 1940s. And what Shannon showed, and I think this, this is a perfect example of what Shannon showed, is that you can still have the probability of error going down exponentially fast, as it does here, while the rate doesn't go to zero. The rate stays at a fixed value, as long as you're not trying to communicate. So in other words, as long as you're trying to communicate above a certain threshold to solve the channel capacity, you, can, you don't need to have a rate zero code to get effectively a rate a, a, a zero probability of error. Now, this is a very intuition, intuitive understanding, but this is essentially a large part of what this class is all about already in the first day. So any questions? So I, I hope that maybe some of you can sort of imagine. Imagine you're back in the 1940s. There's no internet. Um, you're driving, um, I don't know, Ford? I don't know, what kind of cars? I don't know. I, I, I'm not ready to sort of apart the notion of the 1940s. Everybody's listening to Benny Goodman. Does anyone know who Benny Goodman is? So raise your hand if you've heard of Benny Goodman. Nobody's heard of Benny Goodman. Wow. OK. Let's say that you're. He, he was world famous. Um, Duke Ellington, does anybody know who Duke Ellington is? OK, so let's say you're listening to Duke Ellington. Um, although, uh, so, so, then, so then somebody comes along and says, actually, you can communicate at a non-zero rate with zero probability of error. That would be pretty mind-blowing. So oh, now this thing is turned off because I've been talking so much. Hopefully, I didn't. Oh, good. OK, it still works. OK, so let's, um, I think, um, I want to skip this example. I think we, we need, I usually like to take a, a break, um, but um, let's take a short break and um, um, come back in a few minutes. Because I, I, it's a two-hour class, so we should take a short break. Okay, so I think we're back now. I hope. Let's just check. Yes, we're back. Okay, so so one of the things, so we said, like for example, in this particular code, why is it the case that we we don't end up, at least intuitively, before we actually get onto uh, the real the real stuff, like why is it that we can comp uh, communicate at a rate that doesn't go to zero, as, even though the error goes to zero? So the the basic idea is sort of something that people intuitively understood even back in the um, 19th century. Uh, with uh, the Morse code. So Morse, this was at the time of telegraph lines. And telegraph lines were extraordinarily noisy. I mean, unbelievably noisy. So noisy that the only thing that they could actually, you could send was a dot, was, a, was an on or not. It was a beep or not a beep. So open, closed circuit, that was it. 
And the way you communicated was via a series of, of dots and dashes. And you know, this was revolutionary. You, know, you could actually send a message from, say, London to Nairobi in a very short amount of time once telegraph lines were installed. And the way that the messages were communicated was that you took the, the, ink, the sort of um, European alphabet, I guess, or the English alphabet, and you encoded the letters with, each letter was encoded with a series of dots and dashes. Everybody knows what Morse code is, right? Raise your hand if you don't know what Morse code is. Okay, so you know what Dorothy now. Now the critical thing about this was, was that some of the letters had a longer encoding and some of the letters had a shorter encoding. So why do you think that was? Why wasn't it the case that you used the same length encoding for every letter? The less common letters have a longer encoding. Right? So for example, like look at the look at the letter Q, wherever it is. The Q has got two dashes and dots and a dash. And compare that with the letter E, right? which has just one dot. Turns out the letter E is one of the most frequent letters in the English language, and letter Q is one of the least frequent. And you know, Base and commas, punctuation, have much longer encodings than letters because punctuation, commas, occur much less frequently than do letters. Um, and so in some sense, they got the essence of, of coding theory right, that very, very probable things should be given a very short code and very, very improbable things should be given a very long code, code word, I guess you would say, really. Um, and the reason why is because then if you look at the probabilities, you look at the expected length. Like if you sum up the probability of a letter times its length, that decreases the overall expected length of the code. So that is the, that is the critical thing. That you look at the probability, you look at the statistics of the signal. And even if the signal is not statistically generated, like when you're writing something, you can say, I'm not, I'm not a probability distribution. I'm a, I'm a person. I mean, I'm not... You shouldn't call, don't call me a number. You know, people can get offended about that. But even if it's the case, you can say, fine, you know, you're not a probability distribution. I'm not calling you a probability distribution, but there is still a histogram of your letters, right? And I can use that to decide what, and it's not uniform, and I can use that to decide what letters to give more bits to, or, or in this particular case, longer series of dashes and dots. So that idea is, is sort of, was sort of intuitively known. That's, that's essentially what this is. The most frequently letter sent with the, is, is the shortest code with one dot. Now in this particular case, um, we're going to talk a little bit, when we talk about coding theory, prefix codes. Like in this case, you know, E and F might be prefix, might have common prefixes. Like E has a dot and F starts with a dot. That's called a non-prefix free code. But we'll talk about that. Um, and whether or not there's any benefit or detriment to having a prefix-free code, meaning code where no code words are prefixes of each other. Um, and in some sense it uses binary data. Right? It's binary, but it's really, it's really an analog signal. Either there's a tone or there's not a tone. Okay, so here's another example of human speech. So the source of the human speech might be thought and the vocal tract. So when, what it, our, the medium, the communication medium of the speech is the, is the air, right? pressure waves, sound pressure waves being sent from my mouth to your ears. Um, the encoder is the human vocal tract, which consists of the glottis and the movements of the articulators, the mouth and the tongue and the throats and all of these other aspects of the vocal tract, which somehow work in tandem to sort of send a message over the medium sound wave, which then vibrates your eardrum and creates essentially a neural signal that imparts in you a message hopefully corresponding to what I said. It, does it correspond to what I said? I don't know. You won't know, because if the message doesn't correspond to what I said, you'll never know, because you don't know what I said uh, otherwise. So the channel is the air. Noise is this laptop. People talking in the hallway. I don't know, there's no wind, but I mean, there's there's no there's fan noise, this this thing noise, I and mean, there's noise all around us. But we can somehow tune that in. You can you get the words I'm I'm saying perfectly. You could if you could write fast enough, you could write down the words I'm saying exactly, even though you're not hearing them perfectly. There's noise. So why is that? Because there's redundancy. The encoder is the human auditory system, and the receiver. What is the receiver? That's your brain. Um, so. 
sometimes we actually know the code. So this is sort of like the difference between um, information theory and pattern recognition. Like when when we when we write the encoder, so like we might have some source, which might be some music file. We don't know that, but we're the ones who do the encoder. So we know the way in which redundancy is added to the bits. And so the decoder can sort of take advantage of saying, I know how the, how the signal was constructed, but it might be a version, a noisy version of the way that the signal is constructed. But other times we don't really know the, the code. Like imagine doing automatic speech recognition and trying to use an information theoretic way of doing automatic speech recognition. So you might say, okay, this is my way, this is my model of speech recognition. I have to take some signal which has been, you know, maybe encoded in this box and sent through a channel, but I don't exactly, this becomes a, a, a sort of a black box. We don't actually know how that works. We assume that there is something like that, but we don't, we don't know it exactly. So in speech recognition, a large part of what, if there, you know, if there is an encoding process, we don't have perfect knowledge of it. And that's true also of machine learning. Uh, and pattern recognition. So it's the decoder aspect. So that's the, exactly the point here. This is this decoder aspect here, but we don't know for certain the code, which basically means we don't know this. Right. Okay. Any questions? By the way, you guys are being very quiet in terms of questions. So I'm going to assume that everybody understands it. Could you please raise your hand if everything I'm saying makes sense so far? Okay, good. Um, remember, the smartest people ask lots of questions. Right? So, um, so we don't know how the brain does it either, right? So if we're, if we're, for example, thinking about the source of the underlying idea, we have an idea in our mind that somehow, I, mean, I don't know what I'm about to say. I don't know what ideas are about to come into my mind that I'm trying to convey to you. I don't even have conscious access to my own thought process. All I know is that I'm trying to convey to you the aspect, you know, what is the information theory? In, in today's lecture, it's the intuition of information theory. I don't have access to that. If we were to try to, to, to build a system to take speech and map it back to conscious thought, to, to a sort of a, a knowledge representation, we have no idea what, what this whole, what the corresponding system, the system corresponding to all of this stuff is. We don't. Uh, is, it, is it more efficient to make the encoder kind of if if what you've communicated in the cast in the past has been encoded has been decoded correctly so if you have some knowledge I mean like one way would be to sort of have a perfect communication channel and sort of say um, this is what it should have been right but that sort of defeats the purpose of communication because it's saying well where do you get this perfect communications channel from there are ways you can sometimes simulate it but yes, I mean, past knowledge, and we're going to talk a lot about very specific instances when we, when we have a knowledge of entropy, or like when, when you can, like suppose, suppose you had the opposite. Suppose you had a perfect communication channel going back this way. We, like we could say, well, we received something, but we send it back perfectly to tell the encoder what we got. And the encoder say, oh my god, you got that? Is that what you received? That's completely wrong. I'm going to change my encoder so that you receive it better. That ends up not actually helping the underlying fundamental rates, believe it or not. Um, so, yeah. but, but, but if you're kind of trying to optimize something, like most biological systems, I mean, you, you know if you're doing something right, so you, you can kind of change your encoding scheme. Does it, that make you, sense? Yeah, you can. I mean, it really depends on the circumstance. So changing the encoding scheme based on the environment or based on the past, I mean, it really depends Like, on if do you get feedback, do you don't get feedback. Does it improve your rate? We're going to see an example of this. When you do have feedback, we have perfect feedback, but it does it, it, it improves the computational properties of encoding and decoding, but it doesn't help our rate, which you'll be surprised about. But we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so that's a good question. I mean, it's sort of like a question I can't really answer without having a little bit more tools, which we, and we need to build, build the tools. And it also depends on what tools you have. The tools we're going to have are, these, are the notions of, of entropy. So how do we decrease errors in a communication system? Well, there's a number of different ways. We can use more expensive and reliable components. We can use wider bandwidth. Um, we can increase the power. Like whenever you're trying to talk in a noisy environment, you speak louder, you talk loud so that you, people can hear you. 
Whereas when it's really quiet, you usually soften your voice because you don't need to. You don't need to use more energy. But it costs something to do that. Your voice gets tired. You get tired. You're, you're, you know, it's, it's exhausting to, to talk. It's, giving a lecture is, is, is exhausting, to be honest. I mean, it's a, it, I'm talking to you right now in a way that I wouldn't talk to you if we were just right next to each other in a room. Why? Because we are, I'm trying to make sure that everybody in the room, uh, here's, here's me. So I'm using more power, but I pay something. It costs. And so what Shannon showed is that, you know, given the fixed imperfect analog channel and transmission equipment, can we achieve perfect communication over an imperfect communication line? And this is what I've already said. The answer is yes. Um, and how is what we're going to be studying. You add re by carefully adding redundancy. So I think we've already talked about this. So this is another uh, sort of thing that I've kind of already talked about. Like if, let me, let me sort of ask you this question. So if you trans information at a higher rate, does the error necessarily go up? So this is like a little quiz. Based on what I've said so far. Or even based not on what I've said. What do you think? So raise your hand if you think that the answer is yes. Okay, raise your hand if you think the answer is no. And everybody has to answer, right? Otherwise, so raise your hand high. So who's, who says yes? Raise your hand high. That, that's, a, that's a maybe. This is a, and raise your hand if you think the answer is no. OK. Not always. It turns out the answer is often no. And this is exactly what we were saying about. You can send information at a higher rate as long as you haven't even if you have a noisy channel, as long as you don't exceed some critical rate, if you ex every channel, and this is what Shannon proved and what we will be proving, every channel has sort of a critical rate, which is called the channel capacity. And if you send, if you're trying to send information above this rate, you're necessarily going to get increased errors. And in fact, very, very quickly, the probability of error is going to go to one. I mean, almost instantaneously. But just below that rate, you can send information with arbitrarily low probability of error, vanishingly and exponentially low probability of error. And so something funny happens with this thing. And so here's the critical plot that we're going to be learning about. This is the channel. The probability, this is, there's, there's two things that are the same thing. This is the log of the probability of error, and this is just the error exponent. So, the error exponent, this is, so the, the exponent is e, the error is e to the negative this thing. So this is the exponent. So as if you're transmitting at a low rate, the exponent is, is very, very large. The negative exponent is very large. So your probability of error is very small. As the rate increases, the probability of error, you're still going to get a prob probability of error, but um, you're going to essentially the exponent is going to die down. And so at some point, the exponent is going to be at zero at this critical value of c, which is the channel capacity, and beyond which you're going to have a zero error exponent, which means that you're going to have a probability of error of one. And this is the log of the probability of error. And this is zero. So above the cap capacity, as the rate goes up, the probability, prob probability of error approaches one very quickly. Okay, so this is one of the things that we study. Now, compression has a sort of analogous form, which we will, we'll talk about in a minute. So the first of all, before we even talk about compression, we need to understand what is uh, information. So, um, well, I thought, let's look in the dictionary. And Oxford English Dictionary says that information is facts provided or learned about something or someone. Um, or it means that which is conveyed or represented by a particular arrangement or sequence of things. That is information. What does Webster say? It's another dictionary. It's the communication or reception of knowledge or intelligence. So, I mean, sort of, that's a circular definition. So, it's like, well, information is knowledge. Well, it's knowledge. That's information. It doesn't really mean anything. Knowledge, once again, well, you need to know what knowledge is to know what information is, obtained from investigation, study, or instruction. Or the attribute inherent in, inherent in and communicated by one of two more alternative sequences or arrangements of something that produce specific effects. So information is an attribute. So information is knowledge. Let's look at these words. It's knowledge. It's an attribute. 
or what did Oxford say? Facts or what? Information is a what. So it doesn't really tell you what information is, other than sort of using other words. Um, oh, a signal. That's another word. Or it's a character. Or it's something. A message. Or it's data. Or it's a picture. Which justifies the change in a construct as a plan or theory that represents physical or mental experience in another construct. Okay, so it, it's sort of it's a very sort of elusive quantity to define. So information <coughs> is a, a quantitative measure of the content of information. So this is a this is a sort of perfectly acknowledged de circular definition. Information is information. And information is information. It's a quantity. That oh now here's a nice one that measures the uncertainty and outcome of the experiment to be performed. So this is actually now getting a little bit closer to what we want to use as information. So what does Wikipedia say? This is this is actually one of the instances where Wikipedia is better than, than I think these existing sources because they're updated. Information in its most restrictive technical sense is a message, utterance, or expression of a collection of messages in an ordered sequence that consists of symbols, or it is the meaning that can be interpreted from such messages or collections of messages. Information can be recorded or transmitted. It can be recorded as signs or conveyed as signals. Information is any kind of event that affects the state of a dynamic system. Concept has numerous other meanings in different contexts. Moreover, the content of information is closely related to the notions of constraint, communication, control, data, form, structure, knowledge, meaning, mental stimulus, pattern, perception, representation, and especially entropy. So that's maybe a much more satisfying definition. Thanks. Wiki one plus one for Wikipedia, minus one one for OED and, and Webster's, right? Um, is this information? Oranges are 99 cents a pound. So as I tell you, orange, is that information? Does that tell you anything? No? Yes. Yes. It tells you something. It's cloudy in Seattle today. It's not cloudy in Seattle today. But it, uh, does that tell you? Suppose I, suppose I told you it was cloudy in Seattle today. Well, what if you knew it was cloudy in Seattle? So today? Can if you know it, if it's not, if it's cloudy in Seattle today, and and I tell you it, it it's not cloudy in Seattle today, would that be information? It might be. I mean, first of all, that's a that's a contradiction. So, is a contradiction information? I'm not going to give you the answers to these because these are the kinds of questions that you need to sort of decide. Like, in order to communicate something, in order to talk about compression. We need to know what information is. So is it paradox information? Today it's a paradox. Ordinarily it's exactly as you said, which is like it's cloudy in Seattle today and we don't know, you know, so it's, you, you haven't learned anything. So if something is, it's, if it's something that you know and someone says it again, it's not information. That's a form of redundancy. So redundancy is, doesn't add newness. You're taking an information theory course right now. That's a even, that's a, that's a, redundant fact, right? Does that tell you anything? Have you learned anything by that statement? Maybe someone thought that they were in the uh, business economics course. And they, oh, sorry, and then you, somebody's about to leave right now. But um, How about this? It's a balmy tropical climate in Seattle. As in other places in the Pacific Northwest, warm, sunny days are the norm. Is that information? Another thing, Richard Dawkins will win the U.S. presidential election in 2016. Do you think that's, is that information? Is that like, does anyone know who Richard Dawkins is? Do you think he'll win the election? He's British, he's, he's British but not only is he British, <laughs> he's got a couple other problems going for it if he runs in the, in the, in the, some of the states, I think. This is, um, you have to know about American politics to understand these jokes, I guess. Um, but um, suppose you, you found this out with certainty. Suppose someone, someone, an oracle, comes and tells you this. So this is not a contradiction. It's telling you something about the future. Would this be informative? Yes or no? Yes, and why? 
this is very improbable. And you're finding something out like, say, no way, that's impossible, or that's close to impossible. And it's not actually impossible. Or maybe it is impossible. But it's not impossible. You know, it's not sort of phys it's not physically impossible, although it is sort of impossible. It's 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 by any stretch of the imagination, it's impossible. But then on the other hand, it could happen by some crazy turn of events that nobody could possibly expect. So the point is that it's extraordinarily unlikely, and I think everybody would agree on that, whether or not it's possible or not. But if you if you learned this, and if, if you if an oracle came down and told you this, you would say, Wow, I've learned quite a bit. I've gotten a lot of information from that. What about this poem? Um, I heard an echo in a hollow place, no sound of blowing wind or drifting sand. Some ancient voice was this, a captive trace of gone by speech, of argument, demand. Sorry, this is the only art we will be doing in this class. But whether or not you like that poem, or whether everybody sort of sits back and just goes, ah, when you hear that. Um, certainly not read by me, but is there information in the string of words? Is there information in the fact that it's a particularly pleasant sounding string of words? Like, what if I were to permute the string of words? Or if I read it backwards? Demand argument of speech, gone by of trace captive A. This was voice ancient sum, sand drifting wind blowing of sound no. Does that have the same effect? It's the same string of words, just different order. Which one do you like better? Don't all answer at the same time, please. Like you know, you're drowning me by your silence. Your deaf your silence of the you sorry, here's the quote. The silence is deafening. So please, please uh, answer. This is the fun part of the class. So the former one is better because well I don't know why. You tell me. Or why do you think? Sorry? There might be a message in that for you. There might be a message, a feeling. So, that, so, so somehow there's, there is some information in, in the ordering and, and in the combination of words and, and uh, long, you know, long time, you know, the fact that you say sand, whoops, this, you say sand here and demand, or there's a rhyme, so that makes it, that imparts a different sense. So there's information there. How about this painting? Um, has anyone seen this painting before? Does anyone know who this painter is? What do you think of this painting? It's Salvador Dali. Very good. It seems like you're trying to make a formal decision on whether it doesn't really turn out without a formal structure for what you're communicating or what the information is. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying anything about what information is or not. I'm just asking you. I'm not saying anything here. I'm just asking you to think about if I were to say, is there information in this? I haven't, I haven't said anything. I'm, we will be formalizing information. <laughs> the reason why, if you, if you want sort of justification of what we're doing, what we want to do is sort of think about information and what we think about information and think about all the things that information might be thought of as so that when we actually formally define an information mathematically, we will know its strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so like, we're not going to say, you know, some of you might already know, entropy is going to be our definition of information. Maybe you don't know the definition of entropy yet. We will soon see that. But once we see it, we want to make sure that we understand it. And to understand it, we need to know its weaknesses as well as its strengths. So the question is, if I were to permute these bits, would, would the same information be in this picture? I mean, does this, again, very much like the poem, does this impart sort of a weird feeling or something? I mean, it's more than just the sum of its parts. It's like a really bizarre thing, and kind of disturbing even, maybe. But, and, you know, the sense that it's disturbing is maybe much more in terms of information, and it imparts a feeling, and it imparts a, a mental state in your mind, more than if I were to just run, um, J JPEG compression on it or something. Oh, it actually had music as well, but the music, I couldn't get that to work. So next time you're listening to music, 
tell me it's music. So any, any of these sort of signals, you know, to people have a semantic meaning to it. They, they, give, they sort of impart a feeling or an idea or something. And the question is, how do we quantify information? So information theory uses sort of mathematical definitions of information. And in order to do, create a mathematical definition, we need a formalism. We're going to be using probability and statistics to define, to define what information is. And we, don't, we can't really, and we won't be talking about semantics. Like We can't represent how a signal makes you feel. But imagine that, that there are other analogous things that might happen in the universe besides, say, the mental state that's imparted on you by a given signal. So in some sense, we, we, will, we will have a, a much more sort of fundamental, basic maybe, maybe even a better word to use would be primitive. We will have a more primitive definition of information that doesn't capture these kinds of aspects that people sometimes think about when they talk about the word information. And since, moreover, our, our underlying goal, I mean, certainly in communication theory, but many of the applications of information theory, the underlying goal is communication and accurate communication, that's OK. If we can do a good enough job representing sort of the sort of low-level, primitive aspect of information so that we can reconstruct the signal, so that the receiver sees it without any perceived distortion, or hears it without any perceived distortion, or receives it without any perceived or detectable distortion, then maybe our job is, is good enough. Maybe we can actually have a very, very useful both math mathematical and engineering uh, set of tools um, for building real systems and making things. And that's exactly what information theory is. Information theory is not going to capture the semantics. And maybe we'll revisit this idea again in a few weeks, but we do this at some loss by not capturing the semantics there will be some loss meaning we will lose a little bit of efficiency but we'll never be able to quantify how much efficiency we've lost because we can't quantify truly what the semantic aspects of information are like for example how that picture or how that poem makes you feel So what we want to do then is quantify information. So how can we come up with a useful, practical, maybe low-level, primitive notion of information? So here's our mathematical model. First of all, and this is our, our simple sort of discrete finite alphabet mathematical. We're going to assume the source, which might be a writer or a speaker or a, or a sensor, um, can convey one of, of, of a set of possible messages. And for all you know, we might as well just say, okay, well, we have all of these different messages, and let's say that we've got some number of them, n of them, maybe. Okay. And the source is basically a random source. Source messages are choosing, choosing, chosen randomly according to some probability distribution. Okay. Irrespective of whether or not it's a poem or, or a dolly painting, there's some random, like, for example, in, in the poem, we could essentially just count the letter frequency. How often is the letter E used in that poem? How often is a blue pixel used in the Dolly painting? And our notion of information will be very similar to what was already said, what we've already encountered in the context of Morse code, which is that the information is going to be essentially how unlikely that, that the message is. Um, that basically means that information of an event should be inversely related to probability. Okay. So that which you know, namely that which is predictable, conveys little or no information. So it's anything that has probability one conveys no information. Why? Because it's, it's a certainty. Something with probability one is a certainty. Anything that has probability zero, if you find it out, should convey the most amount of information. So something that's impossible, if something impossible happens, that tells you a lot, right? Because something impossible has happened. Something that is exceedingly and extraordinarily improbable, like Richard Dawkins winning the 2016 presidential election, um, that tells you a lot as well. You know, even though it's not a zero probability event, it is as close to zero probability, as, as close to a zero probable event as almost anything you can imagine. So 
So then the distribution over these messages, on average, determines the underlying information contained in the source. So these ideas, these guys, these kind of make sense. What's going on? So that basically means that if we have a uniform distribution over the source messages, mm -hmm. the source messages, the uniform distribution means that there's the greatest choice. You can choose anybody, in some sense. It's a flat distribution. There's the greatest uncertainty about what's going to happen. Right. So. Um, on average, over seeing many, many different messages coming from the source, we're going to get the most amount of information. So such a source is, in some sense, communicating very, very efficiently to you. right? Communicating very efficiently because it's using all of its symbols very, very efficiently. On the other hand, something that's very, very determined, like a probability distribution which has one prop value 1 and all the rest are, are value 0, that's also that's going to be the least efficient because it means that you're using all of these symbols in some sense to represent a message, but you're only using one of them. When only one of them is ever used. That's kind of a waste. So the constant random variable has the least choice. There's only one choice. And it's the least uncertainty. You get the least inf information by the source on average. And maybe you could say, here you get no information because you know what's going to happen. You get the maximum information because you don't know what's going to happen. And when things happen, you learn the most on average. And this is all on average. Okay. So entropy is our measure of information. Entropy is going to be our, our useful measure. We'll talk about some other measures maybe a little bit on Tuesday. But it's a measure of choice. Um, and it's the choice that the source exercises, you know, the source of the message exercises in selecting the messages that are being sent. So if the entropy is zero, we're going to see that means that there's no choice, that there's certainty. So zero entropy distribution means that you know always what's going to happen. A maximum entropy distribution is going to be one where, as you will see, has maximum choice and the maximum value is going to be log of n, where n is the number of things that can happen. So maximum choice. And why that is, we, you know, we need to sort of prove this mathematically. But entropy is, is um, sort of the uncertainty of the receiver of how, you know, basically, um, how much uncertainty does the receiver, when it's seeing a source, have about the source, a priori? Like, if you're about, if I'm speaking, and if I'm a random number generator, and I'm speaking a lot, and I'm using my random number generator many, many times, overall, how much uncertainty do you have? If I keep saying the same word over and over and over again for the entire lecture, how many, if I were to do that, how long would it take for all of you to walk out of the room? I wonder. Imagine if you walked into this classroom and I started saying information theory, information theory, information theory, information theory, information theory, information theory, and I kept saying that the entire lecture. I think that within three minutes, the entire class would go and they'd say, that guy's absolutely insane. Why is he teaching at this university? Um, so there's no information gain. You would just say, I'm not going to learn anything from this. It's just repeating the same word over and over again. However, hopefully, what I'm telling you, hopefully what I'm saying is not too predictable and so that everybody is sort of gaining something and learning something from the words that I'm saying. So maybe I've got sort of a more uniform distribution. So another way of looking at entropy is that sort of it measures an amount of information, sort of the underlying complexity of, of a message. A very simple, repeated, zero, one, probably one event is very simple. Maybe a uniform distribution is in some sense the most complex because you're getting all possible symbols equal probably. So again, the randomness is the choice. So the more random you are, the, the choice. So we're going to define entropy in a minute. But the question is like, again, getting back to this notion of entropy, like the poem, is that random? Is the picture random? Is any our world? I mean, is this clock random or or this iPad mini? I know some people would think the iPads are random. <laughs> you look if you read these online. Stories. But um, seriously, I mean, it, do we live in a, a world that's tr truly random? I mean, is everything based on randomness? Um, I think that basically we shouldn't even. It's, it may not be from the perspective of coming up with, with a useful theory. We can't really answer these questions. So we can think about these questions, and I hope that you do think about them, because again, 
you need to understand the limitations of entropy as well as its strengths. So humans have this notion of semantics, whatever that is. And there might be meaning that you get from listening to a poem, or from looking at a painting, or listening to a music, to music. That sort of lies beyond looking how improbable that is according to some probability distribution. Like if you take every piece of music ever written by anybody anywhere in the, in the world, and then you have a probability distribution over all of those, like a big giant histogram. Anybody, any anybody, anytime anybody does something new, that has zero probability, right? even if it's slightly new. So, you know, obviously that kind of that kind of measure of information doesn't work from the perspective of me of, of meaning and semantics. Um, like some things are also um, very predictable. Like there's two things in the world that are a certainty, death and taxes, right? Everybody, everybody will die. That we know that. So therefore, when people die, we should say, I knew that was going to happen. And you move on. But on the other hand, when someone dies, especially when it's someone close to you, when it's one of your family, it's a calamity. It's a catastrophic event. It's one of the worst things that can happen to people is when, they're, when people around them die. So that which is most known to happen with certainty is the most emotionally and semantically meaningful. So I guess from the perspective of semantics, we, um, we can't really answer those questions. Or at least I, I hope that you think about these questions, but then realize that entropy and in our notion of information is not going to sort of help us there. Because the information theory ignores this. We're interested in the useful theory from the perspective of engineering and mathematics, not so much one that sort of helps us with sort of uh, philosophy. On the other hand, this is getting back to the useful. Can we actually model certain human properties with a random process or some sort of statistical property? When we look at pictures of the world, you know, trees are green often, right? In the summertime, the trees have green leaves a lot of the time. Um, the sky is often blue or white. Um, if you take two, if you point in two random directions, and I'm putting there and there, and I look at the color profile of those two random directions, if the directions are close to each other, I mean, if, if the angle, the angle of incidence between these two random directions is small, with high probability, we're going to see the same color pattern. Like I, I, I pointed these two random directions, I hit the same wall. Same color wall. If the angle of incidence is large, I'm going to have a much more higher, higher probability of there being a different direction. So there's there's this notion of spatial coherence in the universe, and that's apparently true everywhere we look. Whether we look up in the sky or in the in the smallest of the small, there's sort of this spatial coherence, and so that means that if you know something at this point, you can do a good job predicting what's near it. That's a form of redundancy. And so maybe we can sort of use a, model, a probability distribution to compress things. So whenever things are model this, this sort of property, spatial coherence, that's something that's expected. And so therefore, we can use fewer bits to represent it. Whereas whenever there's like a, if you have a random dot pattern in an image, the have seen random dot patterns. That's something that's very unpredictable. Like each pixel has nothing to do with the nearby pixels. And um, and so um, we've lost this sort of spatial coherence. Tem time is the same way. Like in, in time, if things that are nearby in time tend to have a lot to do. There are these, you know, there's episodes of our lives. Right now, you're in information theory. After information theory, which is actually any second now, there's going to be the next episode of your life. There's sort of there's coherence. There's temporal coherence, and so you can sort of predict things nearby in time. And so maybe these, thanks to the properties of the universe, even if it isn't the case that the universe is random, we can sort of use randomness to help us to compress things and to send information over, over an engineering channel. And humans do actually exhibit purposeful statistical irregularity. You know, the way we speak, the way we talk, the way we walk, the way music is produced, the way art is produced, the way any signal is produced, whether it's a television signal or anything, there's a lot of statistical regularity. 
So I wanted to sort of um, get to our definition of entropy, but I'm going a little bit slower than I wanted to. Uh, but I'm also running out of time. So anyway, I guess we're going to have to define entropy next time. And maybe we spent a little bit more time on philosophy this time than I wanted to. But I think what we're going to do is on Tuesday, since we're running out of time, Tuesday we're going to dive right into en to, um, this entropy section. What is entropy? But I hope that everybody um, looks at this set of slides. So um, this is this, this bit right here. This is this section. Oh, you can't really see that. But, um, well, they basically, this stuff up here, up here, the information stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to start next time right there on entropy. Any questions about anything? So anybody, could you please raise your hand if, you, if there's anything, raise your hand if you feel like you've understood everything that we've talked about today, just so I get a sense. Okay. Raise your hand if you felt like you didn't entirely understand what we were saying. Okay, so good. I think we're on the same page. Okay, so uh, any other questions? <laughs> Don't all speak at once. Okay, I will see you on Tuesday. Don't forget about, again, your homework zero, which is due Tuesday night.